Let me briefly introduce um, what's sometimes called Neo-Taoism. That's what our text by Feng Yulan calls it. Um, known as the dark learning or dark enigma learning, if dark wasn't dark enough for you. Uh, Xuan Xie. Um, now we're working on Feng Yulan, who is is all Wei Giles. Uh, so I'm using Wei Giles first here and giving some of the opinion. Um, okay, this is a development of Taoism. Uh, during the period, uh, Feng Yulan calls it the period of disunity, or it's sometimes called the Six Dynasties, a uh, number of dynasties in rapid succession and uh, a lot of political chaos in the era. Um, and uh, it, it, the Taoism of figures like Wang Bi and Guo Shang, um, there are a number of others, and Feng Yulan discusses some of them. Actually, Feng Yulan puts the Lietza in this uh, period. Eva Wong puts it much earlier. Um, you know, maybe almost 500 years earlier, 400 years earlier. So that's in dispute. Um, it, but it's not, uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, so whether the Lietza belongs in this... Uh, uh, in this bailiwick is an interesting question. I kind of think it does, honestly. Um, because it has some features in common, I think. Uh, at, at least parts of it, perhaps, uh, come from this, this period, or perhaps the intervening periods. One feature of this is it is uh, neo-Daoism or uh, dark learning, uh, the mysterious learning, is um, it's syncretic. You know, most of these figures pay their respects to Confucius. And maybe that's because of the status of Confucius, even in the political system, uh, although that's a complex matter at a given moment. Um, in fact, bo uh, both Wang Bi and um, uh, Guo Shang seem to acknowledge Confucius as the greatest of sages. But I'd say their philosophy is much closer uh, in many ways to uh, uh, Shuangzi and Lao Tzu. Um, and they're, I think they're perfectly aware of that. Uh, and, you know, th these are examples, too, of... Uh, or, or One way to bring Confucianism and Taoism together is to kind of just say Confucianism is a, a philosophy for operating in the social world. Taoism is you know, this dark learning or, uh, that, um, uh, is, is for personal transformation among other things or spiritual, a spiritual journey, perhaps individual. Okay. Uh, and the other thing about them, I think is that they're very, it's these texts. And I, this is one reason why I, 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 I'm sympathetic with placing at least parts of the eights in this period. Uh, these texts are very philosophically sophisticated. All right. Uh, it's not that there isn't a certain philosophical sophistication in the Shuangzi, for instance. There is. Uh, although it's almost like a joke, too. Uh, there is a beginning. There is, not a yet, there is not yet beginning to be a beginning. There is not yet beginning to be a not yet beginning to be a beginning, etc. Right? Uh, in a way, people like Wosan... Um, uh, take that seriously and, uh, or, you know, uh, the, in a way they want to develop something like a system, a more systematic metaphysics. They, uh, they're kind of more prosaic in some ways. Um, that's not true of exactly, but, um, you know, who's exclusively in the form of stories, but, uh, and they're, and they're maybe more scholarly, you know, they're bringing, they're definitely more scholarly. Because the form that they're that they're writing in, by and large, is commentaries on. Um, oh, so Wambi's Wambi has the most famous commentary on the Tao Te Ching, um, and also a very famous commentary on the I Ching, the uh, Book of Changes that we haven't discussed, uh, but which is possibly a Taoist text. 
it's a whole world to get into, though, and, you know, Feng Yulan does get into it a little bit here via YMV's commentary. But, man, I'm not ready to do the divination and the numerology, and I don't really know much about that, you know. But all this is interpreted as having, like, uh, symbolic uh, philosophical implications and, you know, maybe a, as a Taoist text. All right. Um, so, like, Guosong is the person, there's some dispute about this, but Guosong is the person who actually created the canonical Shuangzi text and then gave the most famous commentary on it, the definitive commentary, really, you know, in, in many ways. All, it's not that I've read all the commentaries and many of them are not translated either. In fact, I think this is, it's frustrating, a little frustrating trying to teach this period. Uh, perhaps I need to do more research, but I think there's a lack of like really lucid thorough translations of some of these of the classic texts from this period uh, and also even uh, uh, lucid readable interpretations in English of this period. I've had a dip in so, to some of the scholarship and in English and uh, I, I couldn't necessarily find anything that I thought would make this more accessible. That's why I returned to Feng Yulan who has his problems but uh, you know, it's pretty steady and reliable and gives you like the basics in this, in the, in this, uh, you know, way that became definitive. Now I, I do want to warn you, however, uh, maybe I warned you this before when we, when I used Feng Yulan as some background previously, um, on Confucius, uh, is that Feng Yulan is a, was a Confucianist, 20th century Confucianist. Uh, pre lived, you know, came from pre-communist China, um, and uh, that that prejudice does show. Um, and in fact, he even seems to take a certain glee in attacking a figure like Wang Bi, accusing him of contradictions and so on. I think you probably ought to take that with a grain of salt. Like someone who really admired Wang Bi, uh, and maybe had Taoist leanings. Uh, would work on these contradictions or these supposed contradictions a little harder, you know, or endorse them, of course. Uh, you can always do that as a Taoist. Yes, I contradict myself very well. I'm a Taoist sage, you know, so suck it, you know. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so... Uh, so they take Taoism in a kind of directly, explicitly metaphysical direction. Uh, they're trying to explain or uh, the universe, like a cosmological direction and an ontological direction. Those being the subdisciplines of metaphysics. Uh, explaining the universe as a whole, and then, you know, potentially the role of individual objects or substances within that universe. In fact, this is probably Wang Bi's um, most basic idea, or most the the dimension of a lot of his authorship is the question of multiplicity and unity. All right, and you know he he's often saying things like unity is fundamental, or you can't have multiplicity without unity, or uh, multiplicity emerges from unity. Unity, though emerges from non-being. Okay, but uh, in, in some sense, all these things are real. It's, it, and I think that there's an interesting negotiation in line B. I'd like to really know more about this. Uh, between the idea that there is only one thing, that the universe is one thing that emerges from non-thing, nothing, uh, or the Tao, or non-being, or the darkness, or the enigma. Um, there's some dispute about whether these are all interchangeable in this in this realm of thought. Um, close though. Uh, so the the one the 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 many depend upon the one, but that's not to say that they're not real. They're all, they're, but they're all unified. Like there's a single system, um, 
It consists of myriad objects, the 10,000 things or whatever. But it is one thing. It is a universe. All right. uh, I mean, so these are, these are, you know, you could elaborate on this, obviously. But uh, this is pretty, like, fundamental level metaphysics. It's, you know, you could definitely read this right out of the Tao Te Ching, and Wambi does. Uh, but he elaborates it, too. And he elaborates it in kind of, like I say, a sort of a more prosaic, direct sort of way. Um, all right, and I, I, I really think like Guo Song and his commentary on the Shuangzi is one of the best, if not the best statement of philosophical Taoism. Um, again, I am kind of shocked. I mean, I should I should check whether what the recent work on this has been that there's not a real steady total edition of. I mean, Feng Yulan actually did a, a, a translation like this, but man, I don't like necessarily love the translations either of the Shuangzi or of the uh, or he did a, he did a work in Chinese that was translated into English that consists of the Shuangzi. And uh, at least most or uh, a large portion of Guo Song's commentary on the Shuangzi. Um, that's the most complete text we have, and I think, in English. So like I say, I'd like to see... A, uh, so I, I attempted to assemble like bits. It, it does come in bits because these are commentaries on different pieces of the Shuangzi by Guo Song. Um, it comes in, in, in pretty short bursts, and I tried to do a version of all the fragments I could assemble, or all the comments I could assemble, especially the ones that stood on their own a little bit, uh, into a text I called the Wu Wei Jing. It's a free non-translation. It's a, it's a construal of various English translations, along with some basic work on some of the characters. Uh, but like, okay, so I did do a translation of the Tao Te Ching. That was a very careful character by character that, you know, I did over a period of many years with help. Uh, this is a much looser, freer version. We've seen some stuff like that. Um, but I just I like wanted some I wanted Guo Song's thought represented in an integral integral way and also in a way that was pleasing English because the the, the fragments that we have or uh, you know the in translation I don't think the English has been that felicitous so read the Wu Wei Jing I called it which is uh, up on Moodle. Um, Guo Song has uh, one one other comment here is that there, th this this dark learning period is syncretic, but it's probably more or less pre-Buddhist. It's sort of like the last wave of Chinese philosophy before you really start seeing Buddhist influences everywhere. Actually, um, I mean, in a lot of ways, chi most Chinese philosophy is syncretic, even when. Uh, you know, later Chinese philosophy, even when someone's saying like, of course, I'm a follower of Confucius and I would never touch that Buddhist stuff. You know, like you're reading Wang Yang Ming. Uh, and you're going like, hmm, or Jushi. Well, actually, I think there's a, a fair amount of Buddhism and Taoism in there. Uh, but, you know, these have become basic cultural formations, references that every school can use. But here, I think, you know, the basic ideas are provided by Confucianism and Taoism and, you know, with a touch of other influences such as legalism. Uh, well, that, that more than more than a touch because Wang Bi and especially Guo San were also interested in like how a fi an official should behave or conduct themselves. Quite a Confucian question. Um, so, I mean, I, I just thought I would give you, uh, I mean, I think that I guess this is a question, uh, whether this kind of metaphysics I'm about to attribute to Guo Song uh, is also held by Wang Bi and, uh, or other figures of this period. I think more or less it, it is, 
And I think it is a really interesting uh, set of ideas. So actually, here's the uh, passage that I make central um, in, in, in my, you know, little Wu Wei Jing thing. Uh, I guess I'll read that version too. This is Feng Yulan's, this is the translation of Feng Yulan. Uh, this is the, the version that we get in History of Chinese Philosophy Volume 2. Um, in, this is on page 208, Guo Song from his commentary on the Shuangzi. In existence, what is prior to things? We say that the yin and yang are prior to things. But the yin and yang are themselves things. What then is prior to the yin and yang? We may say that nature is prior to them. Sujan, that we've discussed. Um, but nature is simply the naturalness of things. All right, there's a moment in the translation I don't like. Uh, can that really be a good translation? Maybe, though. I, I better look at, try to look at the Chinese. But nature is simply the naturalness of things. I th yeah, okay, so I think that maybe should be spont spontaneity. The self so -ness, which is how we kind of read this Zhujian phrase. Or we may say that the supreme Tao is prior to things, as in the, let's see, what, what verse is out of the Tao Te Ching? Is it two? Um, but this supreme Tao is supreme non-being, Wu. This supreme Tao is supreme non-being. Since it is non-being, how can it be prior? Thus, what can it be that is prior to things, and yet things are continuously being produced? I mean, so here's the basic thought. It's, it's similar to the poem of Parmenides, if you ever run into this, the pre-Socratic philosopher. Being cannot come from being. I mean, it cannot originate in being, because then there's being prior to being, and we're not talking about the origination or the uh, origin at all. Uh, and being cannot come from non-being. Okay. How can nothingness generate something? All right, so that's a puzzle. That's Parmenides' puzzle. Uh, and actually, Parmenides concludes that nothing can come into being or pass out of being, and nothing is in motion whatsoever, and there's only one thing. Okay. Uh, which This is one of the most perverse philosophies ever articulated, which is saying something. Okay. Uh, that there is only one thing, and it's a perfectly full plenum in which n motion is impossible. Because being can't come from being, can't originate in being, and it, and it can't originate from non-being. I mean, I guess we could run the argument in a, in a somewhat more sophisticated way. It's, it's an argument that will make you feel trapped or at least puzzled. And Guosong is, is quite similar. There's several passages where he goes like, well, being can't come from being, can't originate in being, and it can't come originate in, from non-being, which is nothing. Now, here's his answer, though. I mean, now all the, all the devil's in the, uh, in, in the explication after this, I guess. Things arise spontaneously of themselves. For one thing, it's a kind of repudiation of what we might call the principle of sufficient reason. There is no adequate explanation for why there is something rather than nothing. The principle of sufficient reason being the, the claim that any, you know, anything, any fact has an explanation. In principle. Any, any fact can be explained. Or, you know, reasons can be given why it's so and not otherwise. Uh, now that's basically explicitly considered in Guosan. Uh, and he rejects it. And what he says is being causes itself. It's a spontaneous improvisation or something like that. Uh, it is causeless. 
And then in some sense, each thing that is occurring within uh, the realm of being, each being, is also a spontaneous upwelling within the nothingness that cannot be fully explained, but is expressing its nature in a spontaneous upwelling of being. All right, now, I mean, that, that does sound pretty obscure or impossible or just puzzling, right? Um, it's, but I guess I, I want to say I love it, actually. Um, look, what could explain the whole, the whole of the universe? Well, you could appeal to an intelligent God. That is actually hardly an option in ancient China, even at this later period. Uh, a creator god uh, is rare in Chinese thought, actually. Um, but even if there was a creator god, how will you explain that? Or how will you explain the whole that includes God and his creation? It's inexplicable on any on any cosmology, right? Or like we would try, like, how about the Big Bang? Uh, you know, if you're reading Stephen Hawking, uh, what he says is like, explanations run out right there. I don't know why the thing exploded, or even what it was really before it exploded. The, some things cannot be known, but it did explode. <laughs> okay. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, who I think actually invented the Big Bang Theory, said the same. We can explain every event in the universe by previous events of the universe and the physical forces of nature, particularly gravity, says Poe. Uh, but as to why the primordial egg, the original particle, blew up for a universe, he says, well, let's just call that God. And, and, and Edgar Allan Poe basically doesn't believe in God, okay? He's just saying, like, what he's saying is just, okay, naturalistic explanations run out right there. And one thing you could do is then so, sort of uh, give that a, a symbolic oomph. So, um, uh, like I say, the whole is a, in a, like a musical improvisation, or it's a spontaneous self-expression, it's like a flowering from within that ultimately and, and explanations run out right there um, when we get to the whole. I think it's a profound vision and it's sort of a alternative to theism. It's intended to be perhaps, uh, you know, spontaneous self-creation of being. And I, I think that's one thing, interesting thing about Chinese intellectual history. There's various non-theistic, uh, like metaphysical and ethical uh, options that are explored, you know, through from this period, say the third, fourth century AD, you know, through like the golden age of Neo-Confucianism, like through what we call the medieval period in the West, uh, where it's all, basically all the all the metaphysical philosophical uh, speculation that we retain from that period in the West is theistic, but various alternatives are explored in uh, in the dark learning, but in many other places too, in all kinds of developments in Confucianism. Let me just say Neo-Confucianism rocks, but I think I did uh, maybe I'll link a lecture on that or something. Uh, let me give you just the same passage that I just quoted from uh, Feng Yulan's version of Guo Song's commentary on the Shuangzi. Uh, this is my construal after reading several different versions. For example, Winsit John in the, ham the source book of Chinese philosophy. Olivia Cohn has translated this as well. Um, this is why I make it look not only is it impossible for not being to become being, it is impossible for being to become not being. 
it's, it's impossible for something to come into being from nothingness, and it's impossible for something to cease to be, to go back to nothingness. So from where and how do things, and for that matter, the absence of things, or the space from which, uh, in which they occur, or the Tao that gives rise to things, from where does that, any of that arise? What came first? If we say yin and yang came first, how did they come? From where? Maybe nature came first, but nature is only another name for beings. Suppose, okay, so we can't say, to say that nature is, is where beings come from or is the cause of beings is just a circle. Nature just means beings. Su John. Suppose I say that the Tao came first, but the Tao is only another name for not being, non being. So how can it arise? Okay, how does not non being arise? Well, oh man. Um, suppose, okay, so how, all right, there must be another thing or not thing, and so on infinitely. It's an infinite uh, regress argument. So the alternative to the view that he's putting forward, I think he thinks, is an infinite regress that explains nothing. That's a pretty sophisticated, brief philosophical argument. When you get down to it, we cannot say anything except that things just are, that they arise spontaneously and spontaneously disappear. I wonder if that's an anti-scientific view, or if it's actually compatible with studying the details of the phenomena that have emerged. So I wonder if it kind of says like the whole has no explanation, or if it's actually indicating that each phenomena is inexplicable. I, I think actually the considered position is that each phenomena is to some extent explicable in terms of other phenomena or previous phenomena in terms of causation and the order of the whole. But with regard to each thing and completely with regard to the whole, there is what cannot be explained, the spontaneous upwelling of its own nature or something like that. Well, there's a certainly a lot more to be said but to, before we make that into a like a full-fledged metaphysical system. But uh, like I say, I think this, I, actually I think uh, to some extent the uh, calling this stuff dark, enigma, mysterious, is a little too much. Like uh, there are many moments where Wang Bi and Guo Zhang are trying to be clear, I think. Okay, I mean, so maybe uh, even a better translation, I, you know, I'd have to get some cons consultation on this. Uh, it might be like, learning the mystery, you know, shedding light on the dark. Okay. Um, so that, that we would think of this as learning that, uh, relieves rather than learning that emphasizes the mystery, but it's, I kind of, it's both, right? Like what I just said about spontaneous upwelling of being, or, you know, uh, inexplicability of, being in some respects or uh, at the most basic level, uh, you know, that sounds, it, it, if you said there was a mystery at the heart, you know, that would, well, okay, so anyway, uh, so maybe the mystery is itself non-being, is itself Tao, okay, I think the word actually means like a dark red color that's associated with mystical experience or something like that but um all right so i'm sorry we didn't get to meet live this week uh people are in various situations um and uh we'll we'll try again next week uh meanwhile read the chapters from feng yulan on um on uh neo Taoism in the period of disunity is what he calls it two chapters uh, one emphasizing Wan Bi and one emphasizing Guo San, but also other developments. Um, and try to read the Wu Wei Jing. Uh, although, actually, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Lietza, uh on Tuesday. Either on Zoom or live. All right. And there's a quiz up on Moodle.